Coming up on this edition of Ableton on Air, uh, we talk about health disparities on the national level and an international level with our guest, Shake Musha Drame from the National Center for Health Equity. All that and much more when Ableton on Air starts right now. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yahad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Ableton on Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. We focus on abilities, not necessarily the disability. With us um, to, on today's program is Shake Musha Drame from Bronx, New York, to discuss his organization, the National Center for Health Equity, and why is healthcare so bad in the United States versus other countries. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Ableton On Air. Shake, thank you so much for joining us. It is my pleasure to be here one more time, Larry. Okay. Um, so what are the missions and goals of your agency, the National Center for Health Equity? The missions and the goals of our agency is to do the right thing by the people that we serve. We are headquartered here in the Bronx, and Bronx County is part of New York City, the wealthiest, most powerful city in the nation. But yet, Bronx has consistently been ranked um, the lowest in terms of the health metric. A lot of Bronx sites are dealing with issues because of health inequity, because of, you know, disparity. So we are what set do you up. Mean, what do you, I apologize for the, What do you mean by health disparities in this sense? Yeah, if we're the richest uh, country in the world, we still have um, health problems such as uh, food insecurity. Uh, we have problems with Medicaid. We have people that don't have adequate health insurance when it comes to certain um, situations such as diabetes. So why is it that we're having so many problems? Is it because, and I'm going to say this, it's public access and it's freedom of speech, 
Is it because that doctors are greedy and they don't want to take health insurance and they rather do private pay? No, the doctors are not the main problem. The main problem, unfortunately, is the system. And you know, you know, we we are blessed. You know, United States is blessed to have been the most powerful nation on earth in many areas. But also, if you look at how we gain our powers, then one would wonder how we can sleep at night feeling comfortable of our progress. For example, you know, we get free land from native Indians. We get free labor from Africans enslaved. We get almost free production or cheap production from newly arriving immigrants. And we get a lot of resources because Wall Street is able to engineer schemes that people put their resources. So these are all part of the, our free market capitalism. So I am a pro free market capitalism, but I'm also you know, in very well attuned to how we got here and how we maintain that. So for that reason, if you look at our health care system, we spend more money on health care, but yet, if you rank no, us wait among... No, but we also spend more money on military, if, if yeah, you come to think about it. That is, uh, uh, the Wall Street resources that I just mentioned came because we are able to have our presence militarily all over the world. We're able to see firsthand opportunities and investment opportunities, and we're able to you know, tell world investors that we are safe and secure, and you can make a ton of money. That's why a lot of governments actually buy our treasury bonds, and a lot of private equity investors all over the world you know, have no problem investing in our you know, you know, equitable investments. But anyway, to come back to the health, uh, you know, you mentioned the doctors. I just want to, I don't want the doctors to be the bad guys. I want to well, yeah, let your viewers. Doctors are not bad guys, but there are some out there that are, that are just. Well, no, no, they're part of the system. That system is built on capitalism, and that system is built on protecting the interest of insurance companies and the investors that invest in them. That is why whenever you talk about affordable health care, better known as Obamacare, you know, uh, unfortunately, those uh, mostly in the Republican side ordered, the, you know, immediately said, oh, this is socialized medicine uh, that you are promoting. So you want to, you know, compare the U.S. to Venezuela, to Cuba and what, whatever, or, or, or to North Korea. The reason why they're doing it, because they want to scare people into believing that healthy care for everybody is something that is great because it can prevent prevention. And through prevention, now you can prevent disasters from befalling. But as long as we are denying health care to certain population of the country, why is then that? unfortunately... Why are, we, why, why are we denying? Why, why can't it be health care for all? If Israel has a great health system, and they do, um, Israel created the pacemaker. They created the iron lung. They created the exoskeleton so people can walk. They created a lot of things. And yet, why can't we get free health care? Canada has that. They're giving people free health care. Why is it that we, that we are denying people who really need it, especially... The vulnerable population. Vulnerable population meaning people with disabilities. For example, for many years, because this is so the social security system stinks because people are denied and they shouldn't be. It shouldn't take ten years to get a social security payment. <laughs> you know? I mean, why should we be denied? Why can't everybody have adequate health care? We are a nation of lobbyists. Every industry that need to get their voices heard, need to meet their economic goals, 
you know, arm themselves with some of the best lobbyists in Washington, D.C. The pharmaceutical industry, the healthcare industry, the drug, all these industries have top-notch lobbyists. And every time you talk about providing insurance and healthcare for all, the first thing they come at you is socializing Medicare, socializing insurance. And uh, because Americans in general do not want anything to do with socialism or communism. Therefore, if you attach health care for all to socialized medicine, then Americans say, no, we don't want it. We want our freedom, our independence, and our, I mean, our ability to choose what is best for us. But the bottom line is this. You know, the debate about Obamacare had opened the windows of opportunity for people to know that, yes, you can provide very reasonable coverage for all and to do that, and when you do that, then all these preventable ailments that later on cost so much money, including lives, can be remedied. And so it is all about the lobbying uh, wall that prevent us from having, you know, uh, health care for all. But health care for all is very, very important. Now, the difference between what, again, the Republicans call socialized, uh, you know, health care and Obamacare, Obamacare uh, did not want to go that route because that route would have been fatal from get-go. Therefore, they made insurance for all affordable. That's why you have this health care exchange where every American, everybody can go there and based on your location, your age, and your income, then you can get health care that is suitable to your family's needs without any precondition or anything. I'm going to ask a question uh, in terms of your website. Um, it says, you use a cloud-based platform, closed top referral uh, collaboration and care management platform, National Center for Health Equity, together <clears throat> siloed aspects of healthcare versus a turnkey Medicare complaint chronic care management program. What do you mean by turnkey? You know, a lot and of. And how does that work? Yeah, a lot of the programs that individuals are entitled to don't get them because lack of knowledge. So, what we are doing is we're providing comprehensive education to what people are entitled to and what programs are best for their, for their circumstances, and also what the federal and state and municipal programs are all about. So a lot of these programs uh, that deals with chronic care management, unfortunately, the what patients will have no yeah. clue. Uh, mm -hmm. The United States is an obese nation. Uh, we have lots of diabetes, lots of chronic illnesses. So why is it a chronic care situation? Well, you know, um, National Center for Health Equity is a child of a program that we launched about eight years ago, and the program is Lifestyle Lifespan. We knew that in order for us, you know, to be effective in preventing, you know, individuals from dying of preventable disease and sickness, we have to promote healthy lifestyle because the social determinants of health includes environment, economic condition, and also lifestyle. Once people are able to adopt a healthier lifestyle, then people are able to prevent a lot of the ailments that are unfortunately costing taxpayers billions of dollars and taking our lives too early. So National Center of Health Equity is a product of lifestyle lifespan. And lifestyle lifespan is a campaign where people where we promote healthy lifestyle. No smoking, no drinking, no eating junk reduce sugar consumption, re reduce salt consumption, physical activities, and also, you know, uh, uh, avoid situations and conditions that will cause harm to your mental health. By the way, so stressless and, you know, depressionless situations and conditions. By the way, by the way, to let people know, uh, this program is also going to be syndicated on Parrot TV. So that yes. uh, www is it paratv.org or .com? 
dot com. Yeah. No, no, so, no, 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 New York Parrot dot com. New York Parrot dot com. So this uh, program of Ableton on air and uh, starting in 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 2024, we're going to be syndicated on uh, Parrot TV. Uh, so that would be www.parrottv.com as well as um, Orca Media and other television stations. But um, I, I wanted to um, go further than that. What In terms of medical, why is it? Now, you mentioned, you know... Um, I think it's a lack of education when it comes to people's health because, you know, if you didn't have uh, fast food restaurants, you wouldn't have obese people. If you didn't have um, greasy food sold in stores, you wouldn't have uh, a heart condition. So in terms of these commercials that advertise all this food, I mean, then you then you have a bad health system. So, in your opinion, how has the media been dealing with healthcare systems? Um, because there's public service announcements, you know, don't smoke, don't drink, uh, 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 don't eat. You know, you know, we have to eat healthier. Uh, I mean, I'm going to mention it again. We had that movie, Super Size Me, years ago. What, um, what's one way that we can tell the media to deal with the healthcare system and make it a much better situation for people? You know, as you had alluded, you know, in the opening of this question, in terms of knowledge, you know, I am a Muslim leader, but my Christian, you know, colleagues have always stated that in the Bible, there's a there's a verse that says, my people suffer or die for lack of knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge. So that applies full circle in our lives. You know, like how Moses, we live. It's like Moses once said, let my people go. Let you know, my, exactly. If you guide them to where they need to go and give them more knowledge, then it won't be so bad. Correct. So when, so when it comes to you know, the the obesity rate. Um, yeah, let's talk the, about that. How bad is certain health conditions and then people need more health insurance? Well, you know, it is so bad that even the military, uh, uh, you know, recruitment is having challenges recruiting qualified candidates, uh, mostly because people are overweight, obese early on. So what we must how do early is... How are we talking about? 14, 15, 16? Or, or uh, as early as first grade, second grade, you're talking about six to seven year olds, uh, you know, consuming uh, products and services that they should never ever consume. Yeah, uh, you know, our, dairy. Our former, I'm sorry, our former mm. president, and I'm going to shout him out. Please excuse mm. me for shouting out Donald Trump, but our mm. former president was is was doing how um McDonald's commercials, eating McDonald's on his. On, the, on on the way to somewhere, uh, uh, feeding a basketball team, a college basketball team, Burger King. That, is that the way you want to project healthy eating? I mean, that he, is... took, he took out, the Donald Trump's family took out Obama's garden from the White House. That is one of the biggest challenge you have when you have leaders who are so careless about the wellness of the people that follow and listen to them and depend on their leadership and judgment that is horrendous and if you look at you know uh, before trump you look at michelle obama the first former first lady her number one priority was to make americans healthier move and run and eat right and have right relationship, have right thinking. And it had made our nation, you know, uh, positively impacted with the message. So now followed by, you know, Donald Trump advertising, you know, junk food. And unfortunately, people, millions of people follow Donald Trump, whatever he said, whatever he does. And that therefore millions of people will get hurt. 
the obesity rate can no longer be tolerated because there are a whole lot of health issues that is are associated the, with the, obese. Um, so what is the numbers of the obese people in the United States alone? Do we know that? I, I have, Actually, I don't know. All I know is that it's, it's, it's higher than what can be tolerated. Let me, let me, let's see. Mm -hmm. Let's look up the number. Mm -hmm. I have to do this. Since we are getting into numbers. But while we're, while you're searching the numbers. Uh, adult obesity in the United States currently, according to the food Research and Action Center, www.frac.org, Obesity and Health. The latest data includes 39.6% wow. of U.S. That's adults. Calamity. 39, the latest data indicated that 39.6% of adults of U.S. United States adults are obese. Another 31.6% are overweight, and 7.7% are severely obese. So I'm going to repeat it again. According to Food Research and Action Center, okay, so you can find this at www.frac.org, Obesity and Health, under the heading, um, obesity in the United States. The latest data indicates that 39.6% of U.S. adults are obese. Another 31.6% are overweight, and 7.7% are severely obese. It has to do with the, I think, the BMI number. The, the that, those numbers, those numbers are time bomb. Those numbers well, indicate that. Go ahead. National, national calamity because obese. You said calamity. Obese, you said a yeah, calamity. Obese, absolutely. Obesity is the foundation for so many chronic, uh, you know, diseases that unfortunately we are now seeing increasing in everywhere. And some states like you know Mississippi and Alabama, you know, uh, the obese rate is so alarming that um, it is taking lives of, um, you know, citizens too early. So the reason why, again, we set up National Center for Health Equity is to educate the public about okay. vital um, information that they need to have to live healthier and more productive life by adopting healthier lifestyle. And according, I'm going to bring this up, and it's very important for this, According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, okay, www.cdc.gov. So, according to the uh, Centers for Disease Control, adult obesity facts. Obesity is a common, serious, and costly disease. The U.S. obesity prevalence was 49.9% in 2017. Uh, and in March 2020 and 2021 as well. From 1999 to 2000 through, through 2017 and March 2020, the U.S. obesity prevalence increased by, <clears throat> by 30.5% to 41.9%. During the same time, the prevalence of severe obesity increased 4.7% and 9.2%. Um, so these, and the estimated annual cost of obesity, right? The, mm. You know, people just eating and eating and eating. It mm. doesn't help if you go on a cruise and eat for 24 hours. Because mm -hmm. that adds to the problem, okay? The estimated annual medical cost of obesity in the United States. You ready? Mm-hmm. One hundred and seventy-three billion dollars. You see, one hundred and seventy-three billion dollars in twenty nineteen alone. You see, medical costs for adults who have obesity and vulnerable populations, meaning disabled, 
or elderly, was one thousand eight hundred and sixty-one dollars higher in twenty nineteen than medical costs for people with healthy weight. Okay, well, so there, there you right go. There. Absolutely, there you go. So it is incumbent upon all of us, you, you in the media, me as an activist, and everybody else, to take on this cause as the primary cause to saving lives and taxpayers resources that's why we're doing it what well, because why, if you, if you look you at taxpayer okay so um because there's obesity among young children too as young as... A, no no the obesity across the board you know children and adults and grandparents and the, you know this is a nation of an obese people and the reason for that is you have so many junk outlets out there, and you have so many dis uh, you know dishes that are not in compliance. Well, you know why? With you know healthy, why? I'm gonna tell you why. Mm. Food insecurity mm. is a big problem. Mm. When food stamps does not, we're talking SNAP, okay? Mm -hmm. the, the SNAP program, okay. Mm. Because uh, young mothers use WIC. WIC is another program, you know, where they get diapers and food and things. So, but when you either, Americans don't have time to make a healthy meal, or they, um, food is just so darn expensive. Mm -hmm. if, if food prices was to go down, then you would have people cook making healthy food. So mm -hmm. McDonald's is not healthy. I mean, they try to be because they have trans fat and everything else. But there's two things in the way. Diabetics cannot have white rice, white bread, anything enriched. A bun with a hamburger is enriched. So that's Yes, it's not it, the burger is healthy. It might be, but everything else around it isn't. Per, per, yes. Do you think, or has uh, fast food gotten healthier in years going in the future? Can we see a healthier way of eating out? Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. We we can definitely we can definitely make our food consumption, you know, uh, a lot better. But let me uh, let, let me go back to, um, you know, what you said earlier in terms of the government subsidies, you know, SNAPs and WIC. Mm -hmm. Um, three years ago, those are those are important programs. Go ahead. No, no, they are. They absolutely, you know, any subsidy is important because people need them and they're entitled to them. But, you know, it's not what you do, but how you do it. Uh, three years ago, one of the campaigns that we are working on until today is to making so that the government subsidies are beneficial to the recipients, not harmful. What do I mean by that? If a government is allocating, let's say, five hundred or seven hundred dollars to a family, the well, government it's more than that because I think no. Well, here I'm in, just giving here, you a number. Here, here in Vermont, here, mm. I'm just they allocate something like a family of four, family of five, like almost uh, between nine hundred to a, a, more, a little bit more than uh, eleven, twelve hundred dollars. You know, but by the time it's all said and done, that doesn't feed anybody. People got to go out and work. You know, that is go, go out and work. Go that out. is one of the one of the reasons uh, the campaign that we're working on, which you will associate with a legislative, uh, um, you know, a, 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 a piece of legislation. We want families, individuals, and families who are qualified and are receiving any type of subsidies. To be able to have increased subsidies, but that increase will only be used for health and wellness, meaning that if it comes to consumption, it must be organic, preferably locally grown organic 
you know, uh, 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 food stuff. And uh, example, also, it, example, food co-ops. Food co-ops are one are way very expensive. Mm -hmm. They need to make it more non-expensive, I guess. Uh, that is what so that, that is one of the one of one of the pillars of what we're saying for example you have food co-ops that are mostly using organic and mostly using locally grown so which gives uh, economic benefit to the state and local you know entrepreneurs at the same time give the consumers healthier version of what they consume so what we're saying let's say a family gets five hundred dollars Let's say, uh, let's say a month, you know, from whatever subsidy name. We want that 500 to be increased to, let's say, $800. The added $300 must be allocated exclusively for health and wellness. Meaning, if you are going to the supermarket and loading up with all kinds of junk so that you can stretch your dollars, we want that $300 to be only used for certified organic uh, food stuff, as well as membership, either to gyms or equipment that you can bring your now, home to now, do here's exercise. The thing. Here's Health the and thing. wellness. That is what we're working here's, on. Here's the problem, okay? Like if someone, for, in, I know in years past, and this, we got one more question to ask you. Um, I know in years past, um, food stamps stopped, you know, put a halt on people buying steak, certain fish or shellfish like shrimp or lobster, you know, you know, luxury things, okay? Um, you know, but canned food is horrible as far as the salt content and stuff. So what is one of the things maybe your organization can help with uh, increasing the SNAP benefits, but increase, you know, people want a steak. Yeah, I mean, it's it's meat, you know, um, but how, how can we deal with that? Because in years past, and then also you can't, certain situations you can't get hot food uh, or go to a um, McDonald's and, but, uh, and get... Uh, you know, things with your food stamp card. Are they changing those rules or, or what? Larry, you know, government subsidies aren't meant for luxury lifestyles. Understood. You know, people need the very essential items uh, to survive. You know, food on your table, roof over your head, and clothes on your back. But if you're using government subsidies for luxury lifestyle, then you are abusing it, and then sooner or later, That's you will deny right. the same That's entitlement right. to everybody else. So we can have healthy lifestyle without being luxurious. Steaks and all the other... By the way, you know, we need to reduce the consumption of steak. We need to reduce the consumption of meat in general, red meat in particular, so that we can eat more fruits and vegetables and drink a lot more water. Luxury lifestyle can be very detrimental to our health and wellness, especially if you're using government subsidies, you know, to try to maintain it. It's not sustainable, it's not, it's not ethical, and it is not what these subsidies are meant for. So it's better to insist on organic, you know, uh, uh, food stuff, you know, and mostly fruits and vegetables, and regular clean water will do it. And you will be healthier, and you will not put yourself in jeopardy of losing your entitlement. I mean, every program that ever worked, unfortunately, if it's lost, it's lost because people abuse it. And when you abuse what was intended, you know, to maintain a decent lifestyle, then you deny the opportunity for everybody else. And people do need, you know, these subsidies because people have low income, people have health problems, and people are in, a, in, in situations that entitle them for government subsidy. That's why we pay taxes. Mm -hmm. That's why we pay in our social security account. That's why we pay for so many other, you know, services for later enjoyment. But as of now, there are individuals who cannot do things for themselves. There are individuals who are not able to provide, you know, for the very basic necessities of life that a lot of us, 
you know, don't even, uh, you know, pay attention to because, you know, we think everybody can do it. So I would advise everyone who's receiving any type of government subsidies to be prudent in how they use them and to always focus on the best way of adopting healthy lifestyle through it, meaning, you know, eating organic fruits and vegetables and drinking water. Forget about sodas and alcohols and steaks and everything else that will not add anything but more self-destruct. Mm -hmm. What, mm -hmm. um, uh, so what is the future of healthcare as we are still in the 21st century? You know, Obamacare is, can be credited for opening the eyes of the public. Uh, for so long, you know, the Republicans, again, you know, control the narratives of health and wellness. And to them, everything must be in the hands of health insurance companies that have billions of dollars from Wall Street investors. And they do not want to lose the revenue that are being driven from premiums paid. But Obamacare debate so that, yes, you can have your health care profits, but it should not be in the expense of Americans dying. You cannot have these young people with type 2 diabetic, uh, diabetic can't have access to the very, very basic you know, pharmaceutical product that can save their lives. If you do that, now you're ending up robbing the labor force you're ending up causing taxpayers, at the back end of it, more money that could have been saved. So that debate opened the hearts and minds to know that, yes, you can have not socialized medicine, you can have affordable care uh, services without denying you think, private uh, uh, you, entities uh, their opportunity to earn income from and premiums. Last, and the last question in terms, do you think Healthcare has become, I'm going to say this, and I hope you're not upset. Do you think healthcare and uh, uh, the different types of healthcare out there, do you think it's become a greedy industry? Have we become a greedy population? Um, anything, yeah, anything that is connected to Wall Street can never ever be detached from greed. And greed is what caused most of our problem. That's why we fight war. That's why we have trillion dollar Pentagon budget. That's why we have, we have individuals sorry, who do not. Again? Can you repeat that? One I said time? greed. Greed yeah. is the reason why our Pentagon budget is a trillion dollar. And greed is the reason why ordinary American citizens who work hard and play by the book don't have the basic necessities of life. Decent apartment to live in, healthy care, you know, that can protect them, and other, you know, basic things that even some European countries are enjoying as an entitlement. So, you know, we are a greedy nation because we are a free market capitalism and we want to create billionaires in the expense of the masses. Today, our economy is controlled by fewer and fewer wealthier and more wealthier individuals. Here in New York City, for example, you have over 140 billionaires that you know, uh, you know, concentrate on small pockets of the city, while the masses of the residents in the Bronx can even have decent apartment and 30%, you know, homeless and, you know, jobless and chronic disease and whole host of things that could have been avoided if we were not greed. So greed is what defines us and greed is what is hurting us. And I think, uh, you know, we need to create more, you know, activist, um, you know, uh, campaign so that, you know, we can save more lives and bring equity back in the hands of American citizens, whether it's a health or economic or employment or housing or public safety or anything else. Okay. Um, well, um, uh, before we end uh, this uh, program, by the way, it's going to air um, also in 2024. Abu Delaunay is going to air on ParrotTV.com, uh, PowerTV.com. Uh, uh, before we end, 
uh, we're going to do two clips for them, um, and in editing, it's going to be put put here. Um, let's. Uh, this is a, a short year in review because uh, we really wanted to concentrate today on um, healthcare and and healthcare of our nation as we move forward uh, in the twenty first century. Uh, let's take a look at two clips. The first one that we are going before we say. Um, Thank you to Shake for joining us on the show. Uh, let's take a look at uh, two clips. The first one of 2023 was when Douglas Salisbury came on and talked about uh, peripheral artery disease with um, one of our partners, thewaytomyheart.org, www.thewaytomyheart.org. Let's take a look at that uh, program. Um, as part of our short year in review. Let's take a look at the PAD episode with Douglas Salisbury. Let's take a look at this. Welcome, Douglas Salisbury, to Able Then On Air. Howdy. How's everybody doing this morning? Okay. On this beautiful Friday. Okay, so Douglas, why don't we start with your story? What is PAD and... It's your story, so go ahead. Well, so I guess we could start like four years ago. Let's go back four years. I was working two jobs and like mowing about 18 yards a month. So I was fully engaged in life and doing the manual things and, and enjoying my life. And I was taking care of my mom with Alzheimer's at the time. I moved her in and we were taking care of her with Alzheimer's. So mine started... A little bit here, a little bit there. Started with the tingling in my left leg, and then my legs started to get a little bit numb when I walked too much. And by the end of the day, my legs were starting to hurt. And it it progressed a little bit in the very beginning, a little bit at a time. And I noticed it mainly when I was walking. And then after a little bit, I noticed I had started having less resting leg pain, which is one of the big things. So my legs started bothering me at night when I was trying to sleep. And then it it progressively got worse. And I guess the day it started for me, I was doing a yard here where I live and I fell in the yard. I could, my leg got my left leg went totally numb. I fell in the yard and I laid in the yard and I thought to myself, well, maybe it's time to go see a doctor. <laughs> You know, maybe it's time to have this looked at because as a man, like you were saying, Lawrence, in the beginning, I kept putting it off because it was like, man, I'm working too hard. I'm, I, I, may, I may have pulled a muscle and all the things that we tell ourselves. I'll see the doctor tomorrow. This will pass. You know, I'm just I'm working too hard. So I tried to relax and, and do all the things that we do. And I finally saw my primary physician. And I got lucky in a sense that after the second time I saw him, he, he said, remove your shoes. So I took my shoes off and he pulled my socks off and he checked my, my feet. And he said, I don't feel anything down here. You need to see a specialist. So I ended up with a vascular surgeon here in Beaumont, Texas, where I live. Mm -hmm. And... Through that process, I had two stents. He said I was totally blocked. My aorta was totally blocked mm -hmm. going to my legs. So I had two stents put in. They lasted maybe about six months. And I ended up back with him. And through that process, ended up with an aorta bifemoral bypass because that's what he said I needed. Mm -hmm. So I went through that process, and that lasted maybe, again, about six months, six to eight months, something in there. And in that process, it started off great, and then I, I noticed within probably within the first month after that bypass, my legs started hurting again. I was having trouble walking, but I, I thought maybe at this time it was just me recovering. So I kind of put it off again a little bit. And eventually I couldn't walk again. So I went back to the same doctor. He did some checking, some tests, and he says, well, if we need to do an axial bifemoral because that, that bypass was blocked. 
Mm -hmm. So he said he was going to go in and clean it out and do a stint. So I'm in the operating room, and this is basically how that process went. I was out. He called my brother and said, if we don't do an axial bifemoral bypass, that he would lose his left leg. And my brother's on a forklift at 6.30 in the morning at work. And, you know, Grady will tell you today, what was I supposed to say? You know, do the bypass. We want my brother. He said, I want my brother to have his legs. So we did the axial bifemoral bypass. And that's what I live with today. Now, our second part for our short year in review. Let's take a look at... Um, um, when Kim McNicholas was on, she's the CEO of um, the way to my heart .org. Let's take a look at that clip. And online, we would like to thank her for joining us on this edition of Able to Learn Now. Welcome, Kim, for joining us on today's program. Hi there. Thank you so much for having me. And it's actually, it's an honor. It's yes. It's been so good knowing you over the past few months that we've been chatting back and forth. And now for it to come to this and... I get to see you in, in action and, and be the subject, <laughs> which <laughs> is, is really fun. You're putting me in the hot seat right now. So what the heck is a award-winning journalist doing as a patient advocate um, dealing with peripheral audio, uh, artery disease? And let's start there. Interesting because when I first started getting into broadcasting, one of the reasons I wanted to get into broadcasting was I wanted to create documentaries that would reflect issues that affect the community. I really wanted to be a change maker and have an impact on the community and pretty much create the change that I wanted to see, just be that change maker. Fast forward as I got into broadcasting, broadcasting took me in a variety of different directions. I've always been that sort of trailblazer always wanting to pave a new path. I was the first female sports director and sports anchor in the San Francisco Bay Area. They had some sports anchors, but I was the first full time, I was coupled with being in charge of the entire sports department. Hmm. Didn't matter that I was the only person in the sports department. <laughs> <I was laughs> the, the, way, the only so. <laughs> person? So wait a minute. We, we, women for many years, and then we'll get to the issue at hand, but women for many years have been, have been breaking barriers. Diane Sawyer, yourself, uh, that, and you being the only person in the sports department, <laughs> I see your point. Um, Even you worse, you know, the, the thing was that someone was actually, and I, this I feel bad about, but they fired the sports guy to bring me in. The news director actually said to me, if we hire you, um, or, you know, and then we have to fire the, the sports guy. So I need a yes or no now. <laughs> I was like, well, I don't want anyone to get fired. And he said, oh, no, no, no. It's not a bad thing. We want to take this sports department in an entirely different direction. And so we think you're the person to do it. So I had three sports casts every night. I also became the first person to have a racing show here in the state of California, sponsored by um, a large, it's now called Sonoma Raceway. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of the road courses on the NASCAR circuit, mm -hmm. and so they sponsored it, and it was really exciting. Mm -hmm. That's so now, far now, from healthcare. Now going, breaking, <laughs> now breaking barriers because we all break are breaking barriers in our own way, um, but breaking barriers in the healthcare field. Um, you have an, you have a podcast dealing with peripheral artery disease. Um, you have a wonderful organization dealing with that. So, right. so what is Way to My Heart and how does it help patients with um, artery disease? And, um, and let's go from there. Right. So just to get you to, to that point of the way to my heart org, it, it really was the you know, I had gotten really far in, in broadcasting. I worked for Forbes magazine. I appeared weekly on Fox. I was on CNN. Um, you know, I, I had done a lot of different things. And so I had branched off and decided to become an entrepreneur because, you know, for 15 years, I was really covering entrepreneurship, the, the um, 
the bust, boom, the bust and the reemergence of Silicon Valley, the startups I've interviewed, the who's who, and they taught me so much about building a, a company, I thought I would go build my own. And at that point, it was supposed to be an interview platform where I would train people online um, to, to do media. And it was at that time that Sir Richard Branson's team came to me and said, hey, we need some help with some press releases for this new startup competition that we're doing. Would you mind helping? Of course, I stepped in, was helping out with it. Then it progressed into, oh, we want you to MC our top 10 finals over at the world's largest consumer electronics show in Las Vegas, mm -hmm. CES. And oh, by the way, can you MC the finals of the top three on Sir Richard Branson's island? And I was sitting here going, oh my gosh, I've never built a startup competition before. What would I be doing? And Sir Richard Branson's words inspired me. He said, don't let what you don't know and have never done before get in the way of doing something great. Sometimes it's what you don't know that could be your greatest asset in creating the greatest disruption in any industry and creating the change that you want to see in this world. And so I said, yes. And he said, yep, just say yes and figure out how to get it done. Always say yes and figure out how to get it done. That's when you have the greatest oppor opportunities. And so I ended up doing that. And during that time, I vetted more than 5,000 companies. A lot of the companies that we were looking at were in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I ended up deciding that I wanted to launch a radio show that would feature some of these companies. And it was during that time that a couple of doctors told me that the biggest disruption in healthcare was going to be in um, cardiovascular. And there was this new laser that was coming out. So I went to the company and I said, hey, I want to follow your medical device mm -hmm. from the beginning, the very first case in the FDA trial. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Shake, for joining me on uh, this edition of um, Ableton On Air. Um, Want to wish you a very um, happy and healthy holidays uh, to you and your family, and to everybody um, within your organization. What is the website again? Uh, if people want to turn to your uh, your agency, go ahead. Our website is nationalhealthequity.org, nationalhealthequity.org, and you will find our contact information and some basic information about who we are and what we are working on addressing. So, Larry, thank you so much for having me once one more time. I really, really enjoy coming to your show because I think you're doing a fabulous job in addressing you know, the needs of a community that is always overlooked by service providers and others, and you're addressing what needs to be addressed. So God bless you. Okay. Well, um, we would like to say a special thanks to Shike Musa Drame. Uh, he's one of our partners with uh, the National uh, Center for Health Equity uh, in 2024. And we would also like to say a special thanks to our partners, uh, the Muslim Media Corporation, um, and as well as Lifestyle and Lifespan. Um, mm -hmm. Special thanks to Shake Musajame for partnering with us with all these things on Able Dinana. And special thanks to the uh, Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Special thanks to our um, partner, um, in Ableton on Air, uh, thewaytomyheart.org, Kim McNicholas um, and her agency and many, many others that have um, partnered with Ableton on Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. Please, um, this holiday season, please eat right um, so we can stop obesity. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time on the next edition of Ableton on Air. See you in 2024.
Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Abel Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England Chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.